Hello, my name is Dr. Alan Lumsden. I'm the medical director at Houston Methodist Tobacco Heart and Vascular Center. I'm really delighted to be here at the 49th VETH meeting. It was always the start of the holiday season and we've certainly missed it for the past three years. This year we're actually chairing a session on virtual reality and the role of artificial intelligence. So that's one of the areas that we're going to focus on today. There's no doubt that endografting has come a long way, but there remains a problem. And the problem is type 2 endoleaks. And one of the interesting things is as imaging improves, so the number of type 2 endoleaks that we see improves. So for example, Siemens is coming out with a new photon counting CT scanner. That's going to give you better resolution, spatial resolution. Guess what? It may actually show the end of leak problem is worse than we initially anticipated. So what we're talking about today really is what can we do about end of leaks? And is there a role for virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and trying to figure out exactly what the Achilles heel of this problem is? So, Dr. Rathor, you want to wade in with your thoughts? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Lumsden. I'm Animesh Rathor, Assistant Professor of Vascular Surgery at Eastern Virginia Medical School. And I would, again, like to thank Dr. Veet and Dr. Lumsden for letting me speak on this uh, interesting topic. We have seen explosion of publications in the artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning in the field of imaging, whether it's in vascular surgery, radiology, orthopedics, neurosurgery, and so forth. Uh, and the, the session we are doing uh, on the Friday is very timely in that manner. I, I think with the convolutional neuro, neural network, which is the imaging machine learning software that is typically used, we are able to identify the sources of type 2 endoleak as well as actually diagnose it. And it's very well established that there is a lot of inter-observer uh, variance in opinion when it comes to detection of type 2 endoleaks. So, so this software does put us at some degree of edge and it also helps us uh, with, a, uh, with a AUC factor of about 90 or so. I think it's a it's very high fidelity system and there is, uh, this is exciting time in vascular surgery and imaging. Uh, endoleaks certainly are a bad problem and I think very underappreciated. Picking up on, on your, the topic of imaging, because imaging is digital, digital is data, data allows us to engage all of these different artificial intelligence logarithms. And I've always said that, you know, in, in our world, the end of Oscar world, three rules, first, second, third rule. If you sell a house, it's location, location, location. In our world, it's imaging, imaging, imaging. And it's not just a picture anymore, it's the data yep. that underlies that imaging that people like you are starting to engage in and tell us how do we tease out those really golden nuggets of data that we don't see when we're just looking up at, at a screen. And so I don't really know how to handle all that data. I mean, you have thoughts on how we're going to extract this information and improve the procedures that we're doing, because that's what it's all about at the end of the day. That's exactly right. I think like any other skill, we get better by doing it several times. And uh, that's exactly what how I understand machine learning or deep learning is. We all have our own algorithms when we process information that's presented to us and we come up with conclusions and decisions based on that. And that's essentially what machine learning does. Uh, so they, with the imaging algorithms, they are able to identify the, the focus of extra contrast where it does not belong. And looking at that and the trend, they are able to guess of sort, uh, but they get better with time, just like, uh, Netflix keeps on proposing, what show should I be watching? I think it's gonna tell us more and more, hey, by the way, do you think it's an endo leak and is there something to do about? And uh, I think we'll see more and more of these in the coming times. So that's the intraoperative part of this. What we've been interested in is the post-operative part of it. And one of the things we've been publishing on recently is this idea of dynamic CT scan. Okay, in the static world, we see one view, no view. I believe in the cardiovascular world, Static will be one view. Dynamic is multiple views. And we can tailor the CAT scans so a little bit like having a strobe where you kind of take pictures again and again and again. And you put it together like a quick time movie and you can see the patterns by which the dye is arriving inside the aneurysm sac. Well, let's switch it a little bit to VR. Uh, I don't know what your experience is with virtual reality. I, 
are we going to be even having to come up to New York next year? Is there, is there a, a place in the future where we can engage with one another in a v, completely VR space? Better worse, I like the real experience of coming to New York, so I would come here. But, but that's it. I think it's, it's again, it's, uh, we're going to see more and more of this and augmented reality. And I know there are some really uh, passionate industry partners uh, that are coming to our field. And yeah. I think we're going to see them more and more. I think one of the other implications is going to be when it comes to training our next generation of trainees, uh, uh, because they can all gain from experience from no matter where the surgery is done, I would like to learn a lot from what you're doing in Houston. Uh, it's exciting times, uh, but you know, the place I'm at, we might not be at that much of an advantage of all the technology, and that's where we can grow together as a family of vascular surgeons. So we're now joined by uh, Dr. Kaki Young from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and she's really one of the experts in using deep machine learning techniques for looking at endoleaks and prediction of aneurysm growth. So, Kaki? Tell us a little bit about what you're going to tell us. So what we now have in vascular surgery is a lot of images. So you can use uh, machine learning and deep learning uh, to analyze these images efficiently. And uh, therefore, like during um, a DSA, at the end of your procedure, we noticed that uh, evaluating endoleaks is very hard. Some, there is a type one or is a type two. What is it? So we scored that and we saw that uh, only 15% uh, was um, similar evaluated between intervention radiologists and vascular surgeons. And also 50% of the endoleaks is even not there anymore at the first CTA scan. So what does a uh, DSA image mean? So therefore we have analyzed all these images during DSA and uh, now we can um, evaluate and visualize these analytics during EVAR already at the end of the procedure with a prediction of 0.97 to say to, to help the physician in clinical decision making like, okay, here is an analytic and there is no analytic. And right now we are trying to classify it as well using preoperative and postoperative images to, to predict endoleaks beforehand. If you put in a stand graft, will there be an endoleak? And after putting in a stand graft, is this endoleak going to persist or not? And what kind of type of endoleak is there? And going into the SEC story, we also have uh, uh, our models to train, you know, is there a SEC regression going to happen after this or, uh, or SEC growth? I'm a simple guy. <clears throat> I don't understand anything about artificial intelligence, but I do understand the number of lumbars IMA, and I presume there's got to be a correlation there somewhere. So for the simple people like me, what's the message going to be? Should we be thinking about preoperative lumbars? Do we talk about sac fillers? Do we take out the IMA? What are Animesh and I going to do with the information you're going to give us? So that's a very good question. So that's why the DSA images were that important next to the CTA images. Because CTA is very static, right? And DSA, you have a time to peak or time to arrival from the pixels, so you know how the flow goes through the limbal arteries and the, air, um, the inferior mesenteric artery. And with your naked eye, you don't know, is this going to be important, yes or no? Are we going to take in into account these, the number of limbal arteries? So that's why AI can um, help us visualize it first but also have a medical, uh, mathematics model to calculate is this very important, yes or no. So our input of our data is indeed the lumbar arteries, the renal arteries, the stand graft position, and uh, the time to peak and time to arrive of the pixels into all these arteries. So all these things, you cannot do that with your human brain, I think, because you just say like, okay, there are five, but what does it mean, five lumbar arteries? But with AI, we hope that all these things account for a prediction of what type of endoleak we will get. I think Dr. Lumsden earlier mentioned we are looking at a dynamic problem from a static point of view. And I think the deep learning addresses exactly that by being able to evaluate several images, thousands of images for, for that matter, in a matter of seconds and giving us insights and having a better understanding. I, I think the 
uh, prediction of endo leak and which ones are the relevant endo leaks uh, that absolutely need to be treated then and there versus what could be washed. And I think that's where, I mean, I, I wish I had this technology yesterday. So we, we've recently published on the use of this die arrival time curves. You put a little marker wherever you want it and the CT scan will show you when the die arrives there. But yeah. we've been using it after the stent graft placement to define so a type 2 endoleak, for example, the time the die arrives in the aneurysm sac is very delayed because it's got maybe four or five seconds. Whereas with type 1 endoleak, the die arrives in the aneurysm sac almost the same time, and so it's very short. Are you doing this preoperatively to look at flow patterns in these various different collaterals? It's a good question because of the first DSA is very limited, and you need, uh, I think, seven seconds to uh, create the image, like if it's going to be a time to arrive of the pixel into the sac. So the first DSA that we do is usually concentrating only on the renal arteries and then you stop. So we don't have this input data. But uh, what you um, are suggesting, that's also what we put in our model. The time to arrive from the pixels into the sac, but also now in our deep learning model we have to a number of lumbar arteries together with this time of arrival of the of the die, and uh, together with the stent graft segmentation uh, and the position of the renal arteries. Even we use all these uh, parameters into one model. Well, that's very exciting. And again, just want to commend Dr. Veith and having the vision to include a session like this. And thank you to Dr. Young and Dr. Rathor uh, for coming and spending time with us today. Thank you.